the shoes are off. <laughs> we finally figured out how to use Zoom, and now we have to relearn how to project. <laughs> that's, that's how this goes, right? Well, um, that's me. And uh, when I was born, my parents were newlyweds. They'd been married for about a year and a half. They were both going to Brigham Young University. My dad was an accounting major, my mother was an English major, and they had a new baby, and they never saw each other. <laughs> and so they decided to take a class together. One class so that they could see each other and have something that they could do together. And what they decided to do was to take a family history class, because you can do that at BYU. So they took a family history class together, and they took me with them. You see where this story's going already, don't you? <laughs> um, one Friday a month, they would drive up here from Utah County to Salt Lake and go to the old family history library that used to be in the church history building, I think. And they would shove me in my baby carrier under a microfilm reader, <laughs> and they would get to work. And every once in a while, because, you know, cranking microfilm takes days, every once in a while they would make a discovery and my dad would lean under the table and he would share that discovery with me. <laughs> um, also, when I was born, I had three of my four grandparents still living, and three of my eight great-grandparents still living. And so from the time I can remember, I was being told family stories. Um, my earliest memory, one of my earliest memories in life, is of my dad's paternal grandmother. Now, she was born in Texas, but her parents were German immigrants. And so the first language she spoke was German in her home. And she didn't learn English till she went to school. And she would hold me tight, and her sweater would scratch my face, and she would sing me German lullabies. And that's one of my earliest memories in life. Now, I grew up because we all do. <laughs> and I continued to hear these stories. As a matter of fact, my dad's uh, maternal grandfather, he was still alive when I was little, and he was a brilliant storyteller. He would sit and tell stories, and he had a little bit of narcolepsy, so every once in a while he'd just fall asleep in the middle of one of them. And then he'd wake up and just pick right back up where he left off. <laughs> And, and, and so he told stories that got told and retold and retold, and I absorbed that as a child. I got to listen to those stories as well. Now, my parents also great storytellers. <laughs> um, so they would share stories. My dad was the family reunion president for a few years, and we would hold family reunions. We would meet together with the cousins. We would hang out at my grandma's house. My grandma, she could tell a story. We were never quite sure if they were true or not, <laughs> but she could tell a story. And so I just kind of grew up surrounded by that in that environment. Now, when I was 12, besides being like the most awkward year ever, it was the early 80s, I was a girl, and my parents sent me to computer camp. <laughs> it went just about as well as you would expect it to go. Um, I came home from computer camp, however, and my dad had loaded the very first DOS-based genealogy software program on a brand new shiny Compact 64 computer. He had it sitting on the desk. He picked up the box of family history that he and my mom had compiled and inherited, and he said, now that you know how to use this thing, I need you to take that and put it in there. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> That's what I did for most of my high school career. Every time I didn't have a date on a Friday night or every time I needed a project to work on for something or other, I would sit down and grab the next file folder or the next book or the next piece of family history or the next book of remembrance and set of pedigree charts, and I would do the data entry from that into this original family history program that my family had access to. And by the time I graduated from high school, I was kind of over it. 
And I left for college, and I actually got a job in the computer lab, which was fantastic. But as I started meeting people out in the world, college roommates and friends and being exposed to more things in the world, what I realized was that not everybody is a story keeper. Not everybody had been as lucky as I was to just hear stories nonstop my whole life. But there were some of us who are. Some of us who heard a lot of stories, some of us who heard just enough stories that we became the story keepers in our families. We're the ones who held them close to our heart. Now, some of you are maybe labeled more the story curious, <laughs> right? You didn't hear the stories and you're just dying to know them. You ask any genealogist who's been doing this for two minutes or 20 years what their number one regret is, what do you think they'll say? I didn't talk to my family, right? I didn't talk to my parents until it was too late. I didn't talk to my grandparents when I had them available to me. And we realize that sometimes too late. And so I want you to think about those of us who are the story keepers, who were the beneficiaries of that, what that means for us, what our responsibility is because of that. For those of you who are full in on family history, you're here at Roots Tech, <laughs> and yet you don't have those stories, what does that mean for you? How do you maybe become story keepers in a, in a way that wasn't available to you before? Well, um, after a couple of years of college, I had taken a few classes um, in family history just to kind of keep up some skills and learn some new things, learn some of the new software programs that had come along. But I went to school in business management. Like, I didn't know you could be a genealogist and get paid for it. I didn't know it was a job, so that was not on my radar at all during college. And when I got out of college, I went to work, you know, had a career, an early career in my 20s. And when I was about 20, eight years old, um, I realized my youngest brother had gotten married and they were getting ready to start a family. And I got kind of itchy <laughs> to do something a little different with my career. And it dawned on me that I could do family history as a career. So I started a family history research business, kind of went all in on that for a couple of years, but that I had been an Ancestry subscriber. I had, I had started with Ancestry in 1997, like minutes after they went online. I didn't know at the time that Ancestry had actually been around since 1983. Since I was 11 years old, this company had existed, and they had been publishing magazines and family history books and genealogy educational books and newsletters and magazine, uh, CD-ROMs. <laughs> I actually had some of the Ancestry CD-ROMs and it never occurred to me that it was the same company that went online, <laughs> right? Um, I was the kid, I was the kid, who, I think it was my 25th birthday maybe, my parents gave me the entire 1880 census on CD-ROM. <laughs> like they were determined, y'all, that I was gonna be a genealogist. But it took me till I was about 28 to figure that out. And, um, Shortly before this little guy came along, this is my oldest nephew, I decided to come to work for Ancestry. That was 19 years ago, 19 years and one month today. <laughs> um, and um, there's been this interesting thing because this kid, he was born 18 years and nine months ago. <laughs> Right, so right after I started working at Ancestry, he came along and he completely changed my entire perspective about family history because I was no longer just the story keeper. Two years later, his brother came along and then two years later, his other brother came along and then Two years later, their cousin came along. <laughs> and then six months later, their other brother came along. <laughs> and 
and then two years later, another cousin, and then two years later, another brother. There's five boys in that family, (laughs) y'all. And I take being an aunt very seriously. But not too seriously, because there's a lot of Disneyland involved. (laughs) Um, But I also take my role as the family storyteller very seriously. Because my grandpa was one of my favorite people on the planet. He had a scratchy beard always, and he loved to like just nuzzle your neck until you got whisker burn and make you laugh until you wanted to wet yourself. And he would smell like Old Spice and wood shavings because he'd be out in his workshop and he would make the most delightful things. And he could walk out the front door and whistle and you could hear him three blocks away and know it was time to come home for dinner. And he died before every one of my nephews and my niece were born. And the only way they know those things about him are if we share those stories in our family. And so I tell the stories. And I find a lot of ways to do it, and I encourage my parents to do it. And our cousins share their stories, and my brothers and my sister share their stories. But we have to tell the stories. That's part of the whole process of it, right? As a matter of fact, I think it's an obligation that we have to the next generation to make sure that those stories are told over and over and over again. Now, I don't ever want to be like my grandma. I love my grandma, but toward the end of her life, well, she was always a little crazy, let's be honest. (laughs) But toward the end of her life, she suffered from some dementia, and I would call her, and we would be having a conversation on the phone, and sometimes she'd tell me the same story two or three times in the same phone conversation. (laughs) So I don't, want to get, I don't want to be that. But I do want to repeat the stories because the stories bear repeating because repetition enhances memory and it makes sure that those stories are told enough that they get down into the hearts of that next generation so that they can then be the story keepers. Story keeping, storytelling, right? It's all connected. Well, at Ancestry, one of the things that I am really proud of is the amount of work that we do to help those of you who either didn't have the opportunity to hear those stories or for some of the stories that got lost through time because there was no teller, that you can discover them still there are still ways to discover those stories. So let's talk a little bit about historical records at Ancestry. Before we do, though, let me tell you a little bit about artificial intelligence. It's all the rage right now, right? It feels like everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, y'all. Back in 2006, Ancestry introduced that little leaf that looked at what you put in your tree and it compared it against the couple billion records we had at the time. And if it found something that it thought matched, it said, hey, look, look over here. (laughs) We called it the shaky leaf for a long time because when we first introduced it, it would sit there and wave. Anybody remember that? And then you all told us, stop the waving. (laughs) So then it just like wiggled a little bit and then it just sat there. Now it just sits there, but I still call it the shaky leaf, (laughs) right? 2006, Ancestry introduced that. And so um, that, that was artificial intelligence, and that has just gotten better and better and better. In 2012, Ancestry introduced Ancestry DNA. And immediately, within just a few years, there were millions of people in that database, and one of the things under the covers that Ancestry is constantly doing is using algorithms to connect you to those matches, make sure that your match list keeps growing as new people come in and are tested and match you. Then additional algorithms, artificial intelligence, is working to compare your tree to their tree, looking at the other 100 million, 120 million trees on Ancestry, looking for a path to show you a potential hint for a common ancestor. That's artificial intelligence. Now, 
Last year, we had a monumental occurrence in the genealogy world here in the United States. Every, uh, every 10 years here in the US, we take a federal census. That census is private for 72 years, and then the federal government releases it. On April 1st of last year, Ancestry was able to acquire digital images, and we were able to digitize that census using handwriting recognition technology. Now, 10 years earlier, we used some pretty amazing technology for the time, and we were able to completely index the 1940 US Census in a little bit over nine months. 10 years later, with the advances in artificial intelligence and the handwriting recognition technology employed by Ancestry, we were able to completely index the 1950 Census in nine days. What? I remember waiting forever for things to come online, and now it just feels like information is coming online at a rate so fast. So with this handwriting technology, handwriting recognition technology, with some of the other artificial intelligence available, and with really brilliant minds working on solving even more problems in getting these records to us faster, um, the work continues to move at a rate that just boggles my mind, and I have a front row seat. Because of this technology, Ancestry is able to bring you records from more places around the world, a greater breadth of records, and at a pace that is faster than ever before. So this is what that looks like. In 2022, Ancestry was able to publish 5.2 billion new historical records in one year, bringing the total number of records online to 40 billion. And 70% of those records are unique to Ancestry, right? On, you won't, you'll, find, you'll find them if you go to the archive, but online you'll only find them at Ancestry. In 2023, because of some of the advances in this technology, we expect to put three times that online. And that was our biggest year ever. This year, we're expecting to put online 15 billion new records. So what are those records going to be? That's what you want to know, isn't it? You're here for, the, here for the scoop. Well, in Canada, the Canadian census is private for 90 years. We think 72 years here in the United States is a long time, but 90 years in Canada. This year, the Canadian census will become publicly available and Ancestry expects to obtain digital images as soon as possible and start indexing those. Right? Um, birth, marriage, and death records. We call it business as usual at Ancestry. Just, we just publish birth, marriage, and death records all the time. And so it seems like to us that it's business as usual, but to you who's been waiting for that one record from that one location, to finally be made available and, and made available online so that you can access it in your pajamas or your bare feet or both <laughs> in your living room at 2 a.m. Because why do we all do genealogy at 2 a.m.? But we do. <laughs> um, then it'll be online. Like that's, those are the kinds of records that are coming online. Also coming online this year are more UK military records. Super excited about that. And then there's this really interesting thing that we can do with artificial intelligence and newspapers. So um, last year, I stood on this virtual stage and talked about newspapers.com, marriages and obituaries indexes. So let me just tell you a little bit about that again in case you missed it. If birth, marriage, and death records don't exist for the place where your family lived, either because the state didn't start keeping the records soon enough, or the country won't let the records be digitized, or the courthouse was burned. Lots of different ways that those records aren't available. One of the things that we've discovered is that a lot of people published clues in newspapers. So-and-so just went to visit her daughter in such-and-such such a place because she just had a new baby. <laughs> and the first grandchild is named after his grandfather. 
and he came in at a whopping nine pounds. Five. <laughs> like, they're publishing things in newspapers back in the late 1800s and mid 1800s and through the 1900s. I often call them the Facebook of their day. We, we get so concerned about what people are, like people put a lot of stuff online and then you read an old newspaper. Y'all, I'm not telling you who I played cards with last week or what I had for dinner on Thursday. But they're putting that in the newspaper, okay? They're also putting in marriage announcements. The courthouses are delivering lists to the newspapers of who applied for a marriage license. Announcements of engagements or elopements are made. Information about when somebody was in an accident or was admitted to the hospital and then later passed away. The obituary published from the family. Right? So all of that is in newspapers. And so Ancestry figured out a way to teach AI to read a page of newspaper and do two significant things. One, parse out exactly what on that page is a unique article. Right? Newspapers, lots of column inches, lots of tiny print. Okay? The second thing is how to read the keywords in that article to determine what kind of an article it is. Is it an obituary? Is it a death notice? Is it a marriage license? Is it an engagement announcement? Or is it just an everyday story? Is it just something that people just news and events of the day? Jimmy played on the local Little League team this week and they lost. Tommy got his Eagle Scout award. Sally won the spelling bee. And somehow, when you string all those little bits of newspaper stories together, you end up with stories worth telling. So this year, um, we've already started it. You may have noticed it with a few states. We are publishing a state-by-state -state index to those news and events that happen in millions and millions of pages of newspapers. And we're continuing to update the Marriages and Obituaries Index. Because two things. One, people keep getting married and dying. If they did, we wouldn't be doing genealogy. <laughs> okay. And two, new newspapers are coming online. So new events, new newspapers, new newspapers online that may have been published originally back in 1864. But just now is being digitized and put online. So that, that record set is constantly growing, which means that index has to be constantly refreshed. There's another place where we're seeing that on Ancestry. How many of you have ever contributed to Find a Grave? Can we just say thank you? Thank you. Thank you for those of you who walk out in cemeteries and fall in holes and are worried about snakes and spiders and still manage to get the photograph that we need of the tombstone in the obscure cemetery. Thank you for doing that. Because for some of us, that is the only time we will ever see any image of any artifact ever associated with our ancestor. And that community of people on Find a Grave continue to grow the collection of memorial pages on that site. And Ancestry indexes those and makes them hintable over here on Ancestry. So we're hinting to newspapers, we're hinting to find a grave, we're publishing censuses and birth, marriage, and death records. All of this is making it so that your tree on Ancestry and the hints that we deliver and the searching that you can do is going to help you find more stories to tell, more stories to discover, more stories to share. Um, so lots of stuff happening in historical records. Now, if you know me at all, you know I cannot get through an entire presentation talking about historical records without mentioning the, the card catalog. Thank you, fan club. Okay. Um, if you want to know what's new on Ancestry, you can find this out for yourself at any given moment of any given day. You click on the search in the main menu and you go to the card catalog. And the default sort for that list of stuff that shows up is by newly added records at the top. And so you can keep track. Did we put records online for Spain today? Possibly. 
How about New Zealand, New Mexico, right? What's online? You can check out the card catalog to find it out. Okay, let's talk a little bit about DNA. So Ancestry now has, well, we have had the largest consumer DNA network in the world. We now have 23 million people in that network. Now, big is good, but, but not if you don't know why. <laughs> the more people that test, the more chances you have of making a discovery, the more chances you have of getting a new cousin match, and that new cousin match may be the person who has the other part of your story. And that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Some of you know I spend every Sunday evening with my dad. He lives in Oregon. I live here in Utah. We get on FaceTime. We bring up our two monitors, our little phone FaceTime in the middle. And we spend about four hours every Sunday night going through the new DNA matches and figuring out how they fit into the family tree. And I send out messages trying to tease people into contacting me. And sometimes I'm the one who has the information to share. And sometimes they come back with treasures. One of my favorite DNA discoveries was a cousin who was a second cousin of my mother that she had known as a child but had lost touch with. And when he figured out who I was after a couple of back and forths on Ancestry messaging, he said, I have a photo you might be interested in. And he sent me a photograph of my great-grandmother as a child. Now, the significant thing about that for me was one, I'm named after her, but two, she died when my grandpa was a little boy. And we didn't have, we had one photo of her, uh, it was her wedding photo, and we had some vague memories of my grandpa's older brothers. But here was a cousin who had had stories from his grandmother, who was her older sister, and a photo that was a treasure. So more is better because it means more opportunity for more discoveries. Now, we have a new, couple of new features this year. How many of you have already taken a look at the side view technology? Okay, this is, again, AI, y'all. <laughs> this is incredible. So, I'm lucky because both of my parents have DNA tested. But my mom's parents both passed away before DNA testing. So when she looks at her DNA, she doesn't know which side, what came from which side? Well, this year Ancestry launched with the side view technology a couple of new tools for you to play around with. One is ethnicity inheritance. So we take a look at your DNA and we can split it out between parent one and parent two. Now somebody's gonna ask this question so I'm just gonna answer it now. Your DNA does not come labeled in your body, mom's side, dad's side. So we don't know. Your parent one could be your dad, my parent one could be my mom. We just split it into two sides. And then you have to look at those and make some determinations. Now when we released ethnicity inheritance, because my parents are very genetically similar, <laughs> I got it wrong. I thought this was my mom and this was my dad and I labeled it as such and I was wrong. Here's how I knew I was wrong. A few months later, Ancestry used the same side view technology and applied it to your match list. So that list of 23,000 or 65,000 or however many matches you have, we're able to then split it parent one and parent two. And I took one list, look at my mom's match list and my match list, and I knew I had done it wrong <laughs> because I know some of those close family members. And so I was able to edit that and label it correctly. Now that's exciting because coming this year, we're going to be able to apply that same side view technology to some more things, like your genetic communities. You may have, in, have communities and not know exactly which one came from which parent. Or traits. There was a lot of talk about napping earlier. I am also a napper also have the napping gene. I suspect I get it from my mom, but we're gonna know here pretty soon. <laughs> okay. so, so side view technology, there's some really fun discoveries being made with that. 
Another new tool that we have introduced with the DNA product, and this is, was just released this week, actually, um, is what is called DNA Compare. So when you're viewing your DNA story, there will now be a Compare My DNA button that you can click. And it will open up your uh, DNA match, or um, a new DNA Compare page, and it will pull in your two closest DNA matches. Now, you can get rid of them if you don't want to look at them. You can add new people to the list. So you can compare up to 10 DNA tests, and they can be people that you match, or they can be tests that you administer. So for example, most of you probably aren't genetically related to your spouse. I had to be careful how I said that, because sometimes you are, <laughs> okay? Um, so, you, if you and your spouse have shared your DNA tests with each other, you can actually compare them now and just see how much you are similar or dissimilar. So people on your match list or people who have given you permission or shared their test with you, and you can compare up to 10 of those tests. Right now, what you can compare is your ethnicity inheritance and your genetic communities. So what I did was I lined up myself and my four siblings We've all tested, and I wanted to see how it all compared. And it was really interesting to see who inherited what from our parents. Because parents only give you half their DNA, and it's a random half, random 50%, which means there's half of their DNA you didn't get, but your siblings may have gotten some of those bits and pieces. And so it's been really fun to use this tool to kind of play around with and compare DNA. So that is, again, ethnicities and communities both that can be compared. OK. Now, there's a lot of little changes we've made to the site. And I say little not because they didn't require monumental effort from some of the teams at Ancestry, um, and not because they might not be a big deal to some of you, but because they have very tiny icons that you have to look for. You ready? OK. <laughs> when you're viewing your family tree, you are now going to look for a tiny little clock up at the top of the, of the tree viewer. And that tree viewer, is, or that clock, is what we call the tree edit history. So it's going to show you the changes that have been made to your tree over time. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but in those 2 AM sessions, sometimes <laughs> somebody's laughing because they get it, right? Like, I wake up the next morning and I'm like, who has been in my tree? <laughs> I, I swear I did not make that change. Well, now there's a tree edit history. So I can't blame anybody else, because I can see, oh yeah, I made that change to my tree at 2.37 last night, okay? <laughs> However, I also collaborate with other people on my tree. So one of the things that I want you to kind of start to think about as we start to think about this concept of story keeping and of storytelling, none of that's done in isolation. We're so fascinated by our families or we wouldn't be here, right? We're so, like, I, I am crazy in love with my family. Like, every one of them, I just, I think about them and I pray for them and I love on them and I spoil them. And then there's the dead people. And you know what? I love them almost as much. Like, and the more I get to know them, the more I love them. But they're not just my people. Now, my nephews are my nephews. Don't tell my sister that <laughs> I said that, right? Like, right, they're not just my nephews. I'm, I'm not just the only aunt. Um, and my aunt, who was my favorite aunt, there were 12 of us that she loved on. And her aunt, there were 24 of them, <laughs> right? So the people that I'm learning about and the stories that I'm collecting in my family tree don't just belong to me. And not only do they not just belong to me, but the perspective that other people in my family can add, adds perspective makes the story more complete. And so, from being in a tiny baby carrier under a microfilm reader, <laughs> to my Sunday nights with my dad, he and I have been on this family history journey together. 
And my mom has played a really big role as well. She digitized all the family pictures. She has spent countless hours typing out stories and making sure that they're permanently recorded. And so both of my parents have full editorial access to my tree because it's not just my tree. Family history for a really long time, it's easy to feel like it's a total me activity at 2 a.m., but it really is a we activity. And so I wanted to make sure to involve as many people as I could in my family. Now, I was really nervous about that, because y'all, let's be honest, sometimes my mom can't get into her phone. Like, <laughs> sorry, mom. I don't even know where the camera is. She's watching. Um, she struggles with technology a little bit, and so I was really nervous about giving her editor access to my tree, because I wasn't quite sure what she might mess up. Um, but I did it, and now I have the tree edit history. <laughs> So I can see exactly if a change is made, if she's done it, and what, what she has changed. So, tiny button, really big deal, because now it makes me even more confident that I can invite people to participate in this family history activity with me. Okay, let's talk about a few more little changes. <laughs> okay? On Ancestry, we have a message center. It allows you to send one-to-one -one messages back and forth in a secure environment without having to reveal too much about your identity too soon or give up your personal email address. And it works really great when, it, when, it, when people respond. <laughs> I have about a five, one in five record right now getting people to answer me on, group, on messaging. So, one of the things that a lot of you asked for as we took feedback and did some user studies was the ability to send messages to large groups of people at once. What are some examples of when you might want to do that? Well, I have a brick wall in my tree, and there are other people who are descended from that same great-great-grandfather. And they have started trees on Ancestry, now, not all of them have DNA tested, but many of them have, have started trees. And so I can send a message to all of them at once and say, okay, what do you know? <laughs> Let's work together to see if we, if we all pool our information together, maybe we can figure this out. Now, if I send that message out to 27 people all at once as a group message, and I have a one in five response ratio, right? A few people are gonna respond back in that thread and what I'm hoping is going to happen, now this is brand new, so I haven't tested this theory, but what I'm hoping is going to happen is that some of those other people that wouldn't have responded otherwise are going to see this conversation happening and want in on it. But even if they just watch the conversation happen, I'm okay with that because it means that I have not just kept the stories to myself, I'm sharing them, I'm telling them because maybe they don't have anything to add. Maybe they're embarrassed, maybe they're new, but I'm gonna make sure that they're involved in that conversation. Another scenario where I might use group messaging is with a group of DNA, a cluster of DNA people that I have absolutely no clue who they are. Any of you have those, <laughs> right? You know they all match each other because they all show up on a shared match list for each other, but you have absolutely no clue how you're all related to each other. And so I can send a message out to a group of them, and I can say, hey, here's the list of 12 of you and how much DNA I share with each of you. Can you each check your match lists and tell me how much DNA you share with each of these 12 people? And now we're sharing that information without having to share our whole match list, which a lot of people aren't comfortable with, and we can then work together to help to figure some of that out. So that is group messaging. Also in the Ancestry Message Center, um, I'm pretty sure I am the number one requester of this next feature, but some of you might benefit, so you're welcome. <laughs> I needed to be able to archive my messages <laughs> to get them out of my inbox, because I use my inbox as a to-do list, and as my cousins and people were messaging me and responding to my messages, that was just getting kind of unmanageable. So you can now archive conversations next time you want to send a message to that person, it brings that whole message right back in, just like other um, contemporary email programs. Now, here's a sneak peek of a coming soon 
and it's so sneak peek, I don't even have a screenshot to show you what it's going to look like. But coming soon, we're going to have a new feature called Info Request. Here's what this is kind of going to look like. Imagine with me, if you will. Have you ever gotten to a place in your tree where you're trying to add in, like, your Aunt Sally's three kids, and you know their first names, or at least what might be their nicknames? but you don't know their whole name, and you don't know who Sally's daughter married, and you don't know their exact birth dates. And then you have to like, go send her a message or a call or a text and see if you can figure that out so you can fill it out, because you've got to get this information into the tree because the family reunion's in three weeks, and you've got to get that printed, because it's going to hang up on the wall, and if her kids aren't in there, she's going to yell at you. <laughs> it's almost like this has happened to me before. <laughs> so... So one, one of the new features that is coming is you're going to be able to do an info request directly from your tree, and it will send her a message, and when her message comes back, that information will come into a place where you can just accept it, and it will automatically add it to your tree. Okay? So, fun, right? The next family reunion is going to be so much more lovely. <laughs> okay. So that's some of the new historical records, some of the new experiences and tools. On Saturday morning, I will be talking a little bit more about Ancestry DNA. So if you want to um, either come in person to or tune in for that presentation, I would love to have you join me for that. Um, but as I think about this idea of story keeping and storytelling, um, one of the challenges that I hear from you as I talk to you is that you don't feel like storytellers, is that it feels super challenging sometimes or overwhelming. Now, my mom, she's brilliant at it. Sometimes, like, I mean, I don't see all the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into it. I get the finished product of the beautiful, typed-out, four-page story that she just wrote. Um, and she has a gift. But we don't all have that gift. It's a little bit difficult, more difficult for some of us to figure out how to tell a story. And so, if you were in the keynote this morning, at the end, you likely heard the Ancestry CEO announce a new feature on Ancestry, which is called Storymaker Studio. Because we believe, and I believe, that every single one of us can tell a story. But maybe we just need a little bit of help. So Storymaker Studio is now the all-in-one place that you can go where your records have been saved to the gallery, where the information you've collected from your cousins is there, where maybe you've um, f found out something about a family member and in a newspaper, and you've got that attached. And you want to be able to string all those little newspaper stories together to tell something interesting. But the key is, in order to be a storyteller, you have to have somebody to tell a story to. And genealogists have learned this, okay? When we start talking about family history, what sometimes happens? I just watched like four of you do the same thing. It's like eyes glaze over, people nod off, not again, right? So there's this little joke in family history that you may have heard before, but if you haven't, here it is. If you ask a genealogist what time it is, they will tell you how to build a clock. <laughs> well, no wonder their eyes are glazing over, y'all. Quit telling people how to build clocks. Let's just tell them what time it is. So one of the things that the Storymaker Studio is going to do is it's going to help us just tell them what time it is. Just tell them the piece of the story that they want to know in the moment when they want to know it and in a medium that they're familiar with. My oldest nephew is as old as my career at Ancestry. He is 19 years old this summer. My youngest nephew just turned 10. And now I have this captive audience but if I try to tell them how to build a clock, their eyes will glaze over. However, if I pick up my cell phone and text them something, and that little sound goes off, they are scrambling for their phone, 
and they are reading what I just wrote them. <laughs> so how do we make that into a family history experience? Well, the Storymaker Studio is going to help you to do that. Tell stories in a way that they're going to listen in a medium that they're going to pay attention to. So last year, Ancestry introduced what are called ancestry stories. Basically, what it is is you pick a person in your tree and we'll help you write a story. Again, artificial intelligence, right? We take the information you've entered into your, into your family tree about this person, the names and the dates and the places, and we turn them into complete sentences, but not too many sentences, just a few. And this is the place where sometimes people are looking and they're going, wow, that's wrong. And then they realize, oh, yeah, it's because I did it wrong in my tree. Let's go fix that and try again, okay? But we create this automatic little story slide for you. Then you can pick a couple records, maybe to tell one story about this person, maybe their marriage certificate. We'll create a little map for you about where they got married. You can put a photo and add a caption, okay? And then you can write a little few sentences to, to tell the story. Any of you Instagram or Facebook users? <laughs> Does this look familiar, right? Do you know how many billions of hours our children and young adults are spending scrolling through other people's stories? Well, now we can get them to scroll through our own, right? Um, and so, this was something Ancestry introduced uh, last year, was this ability to create stories um, in this little slide format that people can then, can then read through and share. These stories are attached to specific people in your tree. Well, this year, um, we've added to that. Because here's one of the things we learned as we were watching you create some of these stories. Some of you, in order to be a better storyteller, you need a prompt. You need a story to tell. You need an idea. And so we have given you a plethora of ideas. Want to share a favorite family recipe? Your grandma might kill you, but she's already dead, so share away. Right? I have the family lemon meringue pie recipe. Some of you have eaten the pie. <laughs> I ha My aunt gave it to me, right? It's been passed down. I'm the one who makes the pie at the holiday gatherings. But if I don't make sure that that's preserved and passed on, it ends with me. And the family pie isn't just about the recipe. It's also about the year when my dad and his brother, who were both over six feet tall and all had a bunch of small children, and we were all crammed into my grandma's tiny living room, and my dad hid the pie because he wanted to make sure he got some, and then my uncle found out he hid the pie, and they, these two grown men chased each other around my grandma's house, leaping over small children, until a wrestle ensued and the pie ended up on the wall. And my aunt very calmly walked in with two forks and said, clean it up. And they did, right off the wall, <laughs> right? So when you tell a story about a family recipe, Maybe there's a story that goes with it. I know some of you have famous ancestors. Some of you have infamous ancestors. Some of you are the infamous ancestor. <laughs> Maybe there's a story to tell there. Maybe you've had the opportunity to go back to the place where your ancestor lived. I still remember the moment I very first stepped off the train platform in Glasgow, Scotland and was overwhelmed with a feeling that I had just come home to a place I had never been before. And that led me on a three-year journey to learn more about my ancestor from Scotland and who he was, and ultimately led me to publishing a book with my mom about him and his life. Maybe, maybe you've had the opportunity to travel, or maybe you want to travel. So there are a lot of different stories you can tell, and you can tell them in your own voice. If it's easier to tell a story than to type a story, do that. You can now record audio on your Ancestry mobile app, and you can upload audio on both mobile and browser. So record audio. You want to talk about the memory behind a photo? Ask your grandma or your aunt or your sister 
to tell that story. And then you don't just capture the story. You also capture their voice. I'm sorry. I have an uncle. He's my mom's uncle, actually. And he came out and he moved out to California from Arkansas and he lived with us for, near us for a while when I was little. And he used to tell the most amazing stories. And then he moved back and he would send my mom audio cassettes talking about the family history discoveries he was making. And when I pull those out and I listen, and he's long gone, he died when I was in my 20s, but I pull those tapes out and I listen to his sweet little lilting Arkansas accent that reminds me so much of my grandma and her siblings. Now I can take those and I can upload them to my tree and I can have him telling the stories of the people that he was the one who discovered in the first place and that I just got to inherit. So lots of really great opportunities there. Okay, so as we wrap up, because wow, we're out of time. How does that happen, y'all? Um, let's talk about just what's available where. Feel free to take a picture of this slide if you would like. Okay, Storymaker Studio is available on desktop. So it launched this morning. Surprise, you're welcome. Um, I know you have been sitting here, so you haven't looked at your computer yet. <laughs> so you can go um, and find it there. It is also available on both iOS and Android. So if you have not yet installed the Ancestry mobile app, would you get out your phone and just do that while I wrap up here, right? Just go to your Google Play Store or your um, Apple Store and download the Ancestry mobile app. It's free. You log in with your Ancestry login, and then your tree is there, and the Storymaker Studio is there. Now, I get it. I have two monitors at home and three at work but I still use that mobile app as a companion to that experience constantly. And it works well because there's a couple of features that right now are only available through the mobile app. One of those is recording audio. So you can upload audio through your web browser, but you can only record it right now on the mobile app, okay? And then that new community stories feature that I just kind of highlighted about recipes and famous ancestors, that is also currently only available on the mobile app. Now, if you want to learn more about that, go to the exhibit hall. Our booth there is set up as a virtual, or a, not a virtual, an in-person walk into a studio, make a story. And we have people there who will help you do that. If you would like some more inspiration and some more story time, um, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow called The Anatomy of a Story, where I will give you some really simple steps so that you can be an amazing storyteller yourself. It's just a learned skill, really. So I think I can teach you that. Challenge accepted, okay? Um, so that is um, that and where you're gonna find that information. So let me just wrap up by saying this. Um, storytelling has been such an intrinsic part of how culture and family history have been passed down for ever. In some cultures, that is still the primary way that family history is transmitted. And it's not just because there aren't written records, it's because stories capture people's attention. It's because stories help connect us. Stories get down into our hearts. Stories spark our imagination. Stories are the way that we build connection between the storyteller and the story hearer. And so as much as I love those little nibblings of mine that aren't so very little anymore, <laughs> I want to, to be even more connected to them. And so I want to continue to tell stories to them. And now they're getting to an age where they're telling me their stories. And in those stories is power to teach and power to heal and power to make sense of the world around us. People crave great stories. And some of the greatest stories that we can tell are the stories that live in us, the stories that we have inherited in our very DNA. And you can be that powerful of a storyteller if you use the tools 
that are available to you and a few of the skills that I'm going to teach you tomorrow. So until tomorrow, thank you, everybody.